uh, HUDS committee will come to order today. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy. Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderwoman Davis. Present. Alderman Kotar. Here. Alderman Ogilvy. Here. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Bosley. Oh. Alderman Oldenburg. Chairman Rohde. Present. You have five members present, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alderman, uh, for the record, Alderman Oldenburg <coughs> and uh, Alderman Boyd had uh, requested uh, um, excusal uh, to be excused because of their absence. Uh, we will go ahead and begin today with uh, hearing board bill number 171 from Alderwoman Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the HUDS committee. <clears throat> Um, board Bill 171 is a pretty simple bill. What we're doing here uh, is removing an exemption to uh, our building code, which allows us to, f to charge a fee for vacant buildings. So <clears throat> essentially under uh, our existing ordinance, we are, we are charging a semi-annual registration fee of $200 to the owner of any parcel of a residential property uh, that has been vacant for at least six months. This is a really good tool for our city and our building division to be able to collect fees for essentially allowing blight, continuing blight uh, within our communities. <clears throat> there has existed an exemption for any property subject to a specific redevelopment agreement with the city of St. Louis and its development agencies. And that exemption for this registration fee has been on the books for some time. <clears throat> but essentially allows preferential treatment of uh, keeping and maintaining vac vacant buildings within our city. Really view this as an issue of fairness, uh, being able to apply that vacant building code fairly across <clears throat> all vacant buildings in the city, excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, I have the building commissioner here today to, to discuss, uh, to. In being in support of the bill. It's my understanding um, that this exemption is applicable pretty much to one developer in the city of St. Louis who happens to own a large amount of vacant buildings. Um, and this allows us, again, to apply the same level of scrutiny that we apply to other developers <clears throat> equally across the board within the city. <clears throat> The city has um, some 7,000 buildings that are vacant currently. Um, and again, this is allowing us to apply a fine for maintaining and keeping a blighted vacant building uh, vacant for an extended period of time. And with that, I'll take questions. Um, Alderwoman, could perhaps, uh, I'm not sure how much of this you'll know, but <coughs> I'll start with you and certainly we can ask uh, our building commissioner come how many buildings typically are subjected to this fee at any given time I'd have to let our uh, building commissioner answer that question um, just to give you a little history on this um, you know in this past year the uh, problem properties unit in the city councilor's office and the building division agreed to basically have one of the one of their members staff-wise move over to our department. Uh, the objective here is to try, well, they were losing budget issues and, you know, and I was able to absorb this because I had a vacancy opening and I also uh, went ahead and had, you know, these duties uh, added to uh, the permit section, basically. So Deborah Williams, who works now for me, who used to work in Matt Moak's office, is overseeing this vacant building project for us. And essentially what this means is that um, all of my building inspectors will now have on their tablets 
a program that allows them to go ahead and put vacant buildings in at any given time. We've got about 3,500 vacant buildings that are private, privately owned buildings in the city of St. Louis. Up until this point, um, you know, with the city council's office just doing it themselves, I think they had about 900 of them uh, in the system. What we want to be able to do is hopefully by summer, you know, with having my 68 building inspectors all looking at them, we'll have everybody in the system who should be in the system, and then six months later, they're subject to that penalty. So, because I think that's a long way of answering your question. So, the potential is 3,500 times 200, so we're talking about $700,000 of potential revenue. That's correct. And those people who don't pay it in a timely manner, the ordinance calls for it to have a $250 penalty as well. So, I've actually got a budget to pay her salary and one other person's salary based upon that. That'll be coming through uh, Ways and Means later. Have we done a one of the things that I've been encouraged, and I've been talking to Patrick Brown for, you know, and before him, many other people, about the idea of increasing the holding cost of either vacant property or vacant buildings. Certainly, this would, yes, you know, take a, a small step in it. Uh, have we reviewed things like for commercial building? Now, this is residential exclusively. Is that correct? Uh, I think I it's thought somebody said residential. I don't. That was residential and commercial. It does. Yes, it does say residential. Well, residential or commercial property improved by a structure. Yeah. Okay, so it'd be either one. Have we thought about changing this to, you know, to include vacant lots? To include, well, vacant lots. I'm trying to think. That would how would that be? Uh, uh, a fee for like larger vacant buildings that would be based on square footage instead of just um, you know so somebody who owns a 20-story building that's right next to the arch that's vacant is would be subject to $400 a year um, that certainly would be okay with me I I'm a big advocate of you know underutilized property taxes that your property taxes go up if you don't use it but um, you know, I think this is a way, something we can do at this level, um, but that, that's certainly something that could be looked at. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if it would be part of the building code is kind of what I'm thinking. The, um, and so there's one, is there one property owner that is specifically exempted from this law that is that correct? Or? Well, anybody who has a redevelopment plan, basically, was exempted the way it was written originally. And I think, you know, at that time, there was the idea that these redevelopment plans, therefore, something was happening. And as we all know, some of these redevelopment plans sit forever and nothing happens. You know, I think it's fair to say that uh, the building division always works you know, with you guys when you have somebody who is doing a development that is, you know, needs a little time for this or for that kind of stuff. So I don't see this as hurting anybody legitimate. Okay, so that you're saying that there is still some discretionary authority? I mean, can, can you exercise that discretionary authority? Yeah, I believe under the powers of the building commissioner's office, I can exercise that discretionary authority. Yes. One, you know, one of the largest challenges you have uh, particularly in challenged neighborhoods, is site assemblage. And um, Correct. when you start <coughs> trying to do site assemblage, your holding costs can be tremendous. Very, very um, destabilizing from a standpoint of financial. So you, you'll still have the ability to do s yes. some discretionary. Yes. A, a, okay. Yes. It, like it's it's just like any other por of portion of the building code where I'm allowed to give extensions as needed. Okay. And if I may, when you're usually when you're doing when you're participating in a site assemblage uh, activity, they wouldn't be under a redevelopment plan at that time anyway. So they could or could not. They wouldn't necessarily already be under a redevelopment plan. So they, th this exemption would not necessarily apply during that as site assemblage. Yeah. I'm trying to think that through. 
so right now everything is subject to it except if it's in a redevelopment area and what we're doing is eliminating that exhibit exemption so it wouldn't it would then be subject to it That's would it correct. okay so everything so if somebody wanted to do site assemblage regardless of it, if it being in a redevelopment area or outside the re redevelopment area unless the building commissioner exercised some correct discretion everything would be subject to it is that that's correct you know uh, i mean the real objective here is to you know departmentally and for the city's good is we need to have a real inventory of everything you know and it's hard to do anything as far as you know managing this stuff unless you really have an inventory and know what you have and, and you know up until this point i don't think we've had a good handle on it and we're going to get a good handle on it well i think there's uh, i've always thought there should be some more coordination done in this area uh something you know i think patrick brown's working on this and a number of other people but right. the idea of increasing holding cost and then i you know i don't think it should be on a per building basis i should think it be, should be more reflective of what that opportunity cost is for the city which would then be either the square footage of the building or the lot or you know uh, vacant buildings have all kinds of negative social costs that uh, increase insurance rates for folks next door to them and everything else but there has to be a, 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 a very thoughtful analysis when you increase holding costs if we do it too quickly we'll flood the LRA you know and so it would be I think behoove us to kind of begin tracking this on a year-to-year -year basis and you know eventually ratchet it up and I could see where we could get kind of creative with this and do things like stick and tear it where you go ahead and you know for historic we could take some of this money and help us offset cost and LRA and then you know maybe even you know tie it together with a you know with the you know a historic preservation fund um, because if you start increasing holding costs to vacant buildings, there's going to be even more interest in tearing them down. Well, we've also thought about possibly having preservation projects, you know, where the city would actually preserve certain buildings, you know, to the point that they're stable and decent yeah. vacant buildings. Yeah. We, but we don't have any really good numbers right now. Is that correct? No, we don't. We don't. Okay. But I, I do agree. We can do a lot of different things if we could get a handle on it see what we've got and then make you know start tracking this and we'll have a good system to get that data that we need in the future thank you uh, Alderman Kennedy did you have any questions for the sponsor no question uh, Alderman Boyd do you have any questions sorry um, I do when let's say that a building is on the register and it's been charged $200 every six months and then it changes ownership do we give the new owner an opportunity to do something with the building or do we just keep charging $200 every six months um, you know with the uh, way that this is written and the fact that you have uh, liens you know we we work with the city councilor to uh, actually put liens on these buildings once it's over five hundred dollars and i believe alderwoman and gracia's got a bill in to allow those uh instead of us doing liens those to go straight to our pro to the property tax bill right. you shouldn't have too many of those situations because the reality is you won't be able to clear title until all of that's done and transfer the property and you might have already spoke to this frank but how many buildings about do we have under this system that we're charging fees every six months yeah right, right now i think there's about 900 in the system i believe you know out of those 7,000 plus vacant buildings we have out there about 3,500 are private so <coughs> we still have another you know 2,800 or so that you know may, that need to in my opinion get in the system and we'll be doing that here this summer and how many inspectors do we have facilitating these inspections <coughs> for vacant property and making the fee assessment well it's it's all the district inspectors you know that who 
you know, do housing conservation, demolition, per, you know, occupancy permits, <coughs> complaints, all that stuff. So it would be each of those inspectors total wide uh, <coughs> over the course of the city, I believe, at 68 now. So it used to be one person that did it for the whole city, right? Right. So you've changed that system. Yeah, well, uh, Deborah Williams was trying to do it on her own, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't make sense. And like I said, there was some budget cuts and stuff like that in the city councilor's office. I had a need for somebody in my office. I had a program manager position. I added those duties into this. So, and we're doing a, you know, uh, first rate system with our tablets. I think you guys are pretty familiar mm -hmm. with what the building inspectors carry and stuff. So they'll always have their tablet with them. Whenever there's something vacant, they can put it in there. It'll annually tell, you know, or semi-annually remind them to go out there, you know, to reassess it. So this by far is the best way to manage it. Okay. Well, it, it sounds like it's a significant improvement because I did think there was a, a lot of work on Deborah just doing it by herself. It, yeah, it was, it was ridiculous. So okay, thank you. No further questions. Um, Alderwoman Davis. No questions. Uh, Alderman Kotar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and this may have been covered and might sound like a silly question, but how do we classify a building as vacant? What, I mean, does it have to be boarded up? I mean, how do you know when it goes from being maybe a derelict building to a vacant building? Sure. Uh, what we do is we call them vacant and vandalized. So basically there's code violation. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, situation where it's, you know, uh, boarded up, but 95, you know, probably 95 percent of them are. If you have a vacant building because it's, you know, being sold and, you know, the owners had to move to Ohio because of his job or something like that, we don't classify that as a vacant building. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Alderman Ogilvie. No questions. Um, that's it. Um, well, uh, our, if there are no other questions, um, the chair will entertain a motion on Board Bill 171. I move that Board Bill 171 pass out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Second. It's been moved and uh, seconded. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Kennedy. Aye. <clears throat> Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderwoman Davis. Aye. Alderman Kotar. Aye. Alderman Ogilvie. Aye. Alderwoman Boyd, Alderman Bosley, Alderman Oldenburg, Chairman Rohde. Aye. And yes. of course I goofed up. Was there anybody signed up to speak on that last bill? No, okay. Um, next bill we'll take up. Oh, uh, Frank, before you leave, I really do think that you ought to get together with uh, Laura Costello over in LRA and figure out what the holding cost is per site or something. There ought to be some metric over there that she uses to figure out what her costs are. And if, if you get with Jonathan or uh, Gerard on our staff, they can go ahead and kind of do a break even analysis for you to figure out, you know, how much money we need to be making on a per building basis versus how much money we're costing. And, and there ought to be a, a, you know, some rationale to that. And I don't know if there's any, you know, I, uh, Hancock is, we, we have to make sure this isn't a tax versus a fee, but I suspect that there's probably some court cases or some something, social costs is a, a classic economic term for, you know, costs that, you know, somebody costs society. We ought to be able to justify considerably more than $200, you know, per, uh, semi-annual uh, to do that if you take a social cost approach to that and, and I think we need to think about how we can go ahead and, and call that a fee. I, I think that more than half of them will go to the penalty. I'm sorry? Probably more than half of them will go to the penalty because if they don't pay it in 60 days, 90 days I think if the ordinance says, then they get an assessed a $250 penalty. So really it's more it's like really a bad. Per year? Yes. Okay. Every six months. So. Every yeah, six come, months? It's for, so it's, you're talking closer to $900, $900 a year. Right. Then. And if we combine that with what Alderman and 
Anastasia is doing with her bill, where it goes on the property tax, it'll be very, very effective. Okay. Yeah, well, still, oh, you, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the social I've costs are probably considerably over a thousand dollars a building, and particularly for some larger buildings. So, I get it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Um, Alderman Kennedy, uh, Board Bill Number Two Hundred Six. Mr. Chair, that bill was actually heard in neighborhood development. Okay, so that was inappropriately on our list. Okay. Let me scratch that. Alderman Bosley is not currently here. Has anybody heard from him regarding his bill? Nope. Uh, nope. Um, Dale, is this a bill that needed to be advertised to Alderman Bosley's? Uh, is that his only bill? Two, 239, an ordinance record. Oh, Planning Commission. I'm sorry. It's zoning. Why don't you go ahead and step up, and then we can always hold it in committee for him um, at a later time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, so Board Bill 239 is a board bill in Alderman Basley's ward. Um, this is the Jubilee Community Church, and uh, the church and their associated off-street parking is across the street from the site that they're seeking to rezone. They've applied for and received a grant from MSD to do what they're calling a green infrastructure project. There, it's going to be like a rain garden, a community garden, an orchard, a little gazebo type thing. Um, and as part of this grant program with MSD, they require that they consolidate the lots, and the lots are zoned differently. So they've chose to downzone from the G commercial district to the B two family district, so that they can consolidate it with the um, parcel that has the existing church and parking lot. Okay. Are there any speakers signed up for board bill number two thirty nine? Can you check for us up there, Mary? No. No speakers. Did you call Brad? Okay. Uh, Alderman Kennedy, do you have any questions at two, Board Bill 239? No questions. Um, actually, well, I guess we can go through and ask the questions, and then we can hold it in committee. Alderman Boyd? No questions. Uh, Alderwoman Davis? No questions. Alderman Coulter had to step out for a second. Alderman Ogilvie, do you have any questions, Mary? Um, and I guess that is it for now. So. Um, We may have to. I just text him to see if he can put some meat this okay. on the committee. Why don't we um, set that aside? We can always come back yeah, to it yeah, then. Yeah. Uh, if he responds, I was just trying to think if we needed to have another committee hearing or not before we. Uh, what time to pass it if we need it today? Or can we put on the formal calendar because it's one cast? True. Well, yeah, why don't we go ahead and pass it? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to pass Board Bill 239 out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Second. It's been moved and seconded. If someone could request a previous a role, previous role. Kotar is out of the room right now, but I don't think he'd have an objection. Previous role request. Hear, hearing no objection, we'll consider Board Bill number 239 passed out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Uh, board Bill number 220, Alder Woman and Gracia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I have a fact sheet to pass out with some information on the project, uh, but Board Bill 220 is a rehabilitation um, of some scattered sites in Midtown and Downtown West that have seen some challenges in that area with respect to redevelopment. So I'm very excited to bring this forward today. It's called the Jefferson Connector Project. Um, we will be adding a parking garage, hotel, a box yard retail, and office incubator. Um, it will bring a total of um, approximately 410 construction jobs to the area um, and eventually have 202 full-time jobs and approximately 213 part-time jobs um, with part-time jobs ranging salaries between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars up to forty to forty five thousand dollars for full-time employees 
I do have um, SLDC with me today and the developer because this is a complicated project. Um, and so if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, I'll bring them up to discuss with more specificity the numbers and details of the project. Chairman, would you like SLDC or the developer to speak first? Why don't we get an overview of the project and we can go through the financials okay, thanks. After, that, nice. after that. Good morning, I'm Jason Johnson and I'm the owner of Renaissance Development Associates. Uh, thank you for the time today. Just a little bit of background on this project. I've spent my uh, adult career working in the Midtown neighborhood uh, alongside a lot of you guys. and. We've recently completed our 56th building in this neighborhood, and we've learned lots of things over the last 15 years, particularly through weathering the recession on what we've done right and what we've done wrong and how we can uh, potentially finish off um, a good chunk of this neighborhood in order to bring to the table some of the things that we aren't currently able to, to uh, have available to the people that are attracted to this particular community. So one of the things that we are, we are looking at in uh, this project is we've been able to, to um, assemble a lot of creative agencies to kind of want to congregate around each other and collaborate with each other in this neighborhood. So as of right now, we have about 45 agencies uh, currently occupying some of the buildings that we've redeveloped. We try to bring residential to the table as much as we can because this, built, this neighborhood was primarily along the Locust and Olive corridors anyway, uh, commercial in its history. And, and you know, in order to uh, pull together a long-term self-sustaining neighborhood, you have to have a good mix of residential and commercial. Um, and in putting in the agencies, we've also added the restaurants and things that um, support the people um, that are occupying the neighborhood. But one of the things um, that we discovered along the way is if we can allow people to rent office space from us and then let them out of the leases and let them grow into bigger spaces, it's been very effective. So out of the 45 agencies that are down there, about a third of them have taken advantage of that program, if not once, but twice. But in doing that, we've realized that um, we get calls all the time for people wanting to be part of this community but we don't ever have any office spaces much smaller than 2,500 square feet. So as we've looked for a building in this particular neighborhood in order to bring that to the table, the old Beaumont Exchange building right behind the big AT&T Tower is perfect for that project because um, ironically, the building is shaped like an E so you can get light into the center of the building allowing us to get much smaller office spaces. So this project, as we started looking eastward, um, we, it's kind of been brought to the table around that particular building and bringing small office spaces together and then another residential population uh, that will connect some of the um, residential units that we've already um, brought to the table in Midtown to the downtown West neighborhood. So one of the problems with this particular building is there's a lot of big great corporate institutions around there but that's about it. Uh, there's been a lot of development on the residential side in the downtown West neighborhood but there's not a whole lot of amenities and things that really create a neighborhood. So in essence, this project has ballooned to a much bigger size, um, 55 to 70 million, depending on how all the pieces kind of fall together here, kind of around this Beaumont building. Um, we have the Mendenhall building, which is we're anxiously awaiting our approvals here so we can get started on construction. Um, we'll bring to the table 1,000 to 2,500 square foot office units. The Beaumont building will have some co-working space, 600 to 1,000 square foot office um, spaces. So that'll fully allow us to incubate creative office users, this whole big kind of startup innovation thing that St. Louis has got going for it really well, um, from uh, renting a desk space all the way up to our 10,000 square foot office spaces in Midtown. So in order to make this project effective, um, we need to also bring together some retail and some other things that the neighborhood doesn't really have. Um, and so we've discovered a group out of Tulsa, Oklahoma that did a, a shipping container retail village. They've done it very well. We're partnering with them in order to do that in the neighborhood. Retail is very hard. Um, we're looking at the models of retail and how things are going much smaller and much more experiential. This model fits that really well. Um, even though we have a lot of big corporate butts and seats there every day, we have a lot of residential in downtown West. We have a lot of people in the Midtown you know, Design District already. Um, we really need a hotel in order to also support out-of-town dollars supporting that retail facility. The whole idea is that somebody can come in for a job interview at an agency in Midtown, come in from the airport, stay at a cool hotel, have the shopping, the music, the food, all the creative people around them in order to make them want to relocate to St. Louis. So this particular project brings all those things to the table. It's an aggressive project. We're hoping to do all phases um, in about two and a half years. 
Um, we do have a $7 million allocation from the SLDC for part of this project. We have HUD financing in, in motion for the Beaumont building, which is getting uh, relatively close to getting that approval. And so we're, the only thing that we're, we're missing right now is our final agreement with AT&T and um, a, a remaining $7 million allocation that we're negotiating on right now um, for, um, to complete this whole project, barring that we get the tax abatement um, for sure. So I know that's probably a, a little bit longer than that you're hoping for, but I think it's important to understand a little bit of where we've been and how important this project is in order to, to kind of finish stabilizing everything that we've started and capitalize on um, put it, filling in the missing pieces of things that we no longer, or that we don't have as of right now. So, I, you, do we have like an overview that describes the prod, you know, the, the actual square footage or the number, how many buildings are actually involved? Yes. Yeah, I think if you look at uh, hopefully the second page in color, you can see the, um, the buildings that are highlighted. So there's three buildings. So the, the building, if, if you look at the map, the building in the orange all the way to the right, that's the building, the Mendenhall building, that's the building, it's 52,000 square feet, and that's the building that's 1,000 to 1,500 square foot office spaces. If you look at the building in the yellow, that's the Beaumont building, that's 60 apartments in the 25, 600 to 1,000 square foot office spaces with the co-working. The building in the green is the new construction parking garage and retail on the first floor. The building in the red or pink is the hotel. The building across the street from that is the, um, in the blue, is the Boxyard Retail Village. And then in addition to that, there's another 14 much smaller little buildings around that that will all come online if we can kind of finish off the thrust of these, these phases. So the building, and just from a timing perspective, the building in the orange is ready for um, construction to start as soon as we receive the tax abatement approval. The building in the yellow, the big Beaumont building, is pending the release of um, the state historic tax credits in July, our HUD financing and the tax abatement approval. Um, and then the hotel, box yard, and parking garage all are pending the tax, tax abatement approval. Um, and we have all but $7 million with the new market tax credit allocation that we need. We feel pretty good about getting that resolved or getting that issue here relatively quickly. So Beaumont, and then putting per, into perspective, the Beaumont building is 100,000 square feet that in the yellow. Again, the, the orange building is 50,000 square feet. The hotel is actually 125 rooms, nine story. The retail box yard village is about 30,000 square feet of retail space altogether. It's actually um, 68, I think, uh, shipping containers put together on two levels. And then the uh, parking garage will have about 250 cars and it will have um, about 10,000 square feet of retail. The idea with the parking garage is we want to put retail along the street front in order to make this whole this whole intersection as dense as possible from an urban perspective so it, it stays very walkable. If, when you said agencies, are those advertising agencies? or? or yeah, so it's a little bit loose on how we look at that, but it really is branding firms, PR firms, website design, architectural firms, photography studios, um, that kind of um, video production. So our own miniature version of Madison Avenue. Down. Yeah, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we bring up uh, Jonathan, if that's... Good morning. Um, do you guys all have a copy of my report in front of you? Okay, so um, what we're looking at today, this project, is um, uh, first of all, the, the rate of return seems to be within a, a normal range. Um, even with the incentive, the 10-year abatement, it's at an 8.9% um, unlevered rate of return, um, which falls into the range of between 8 and 10.8 uh, for projects like this in the region. So. Uh, the region, um, it does seem to, especially with, given the level of risk, it does seem that um, uh, some level of incentive is warranted for a project like this. 
Now, looking at the cost benefit to the city, the project is estimated to generate about $6.7 million to the city uh, in gross revenues over a 10-year period. Um, the city's portion of the abatement is about $1.2 million, and then we're taking out one3 for um, substitution effect. Um, the baseline, which includes um, the estimated uh, jobs that are going to be um, sort of relocated here from elsewhere in the city is another $580,000. That's, uh, so that includes the baseline pay property tax and baseline um, payroll tax and earnings tax that the city would be getting uh, from those businesses elsewhere. So um, all those numbers, what they get you is about 4.2 million in, in net revenue, but then minus that base, it's about 3.6 million in new revenue to the city over a 10 year period and about 683,000 to the school district in that same uh, same amount of time. Um, looking at the longer term, the 30-year return, um, the project is going to generate um, just under 22 million, 21.8 million, roughly, uh, over a 30-year period, um, given you know moderate growth assumptions of about one and a half percent a year after sort of like the first 10 years. Um, we compare that to the average commercial property, so. Um, Again, one of the things I want to point out, because um, it came up in discussion with the alderwoman, uh, is um, the way that the uh, scoring methodology that I use works is it tries to uh, put every project sort of on a, um, in a sense, on an even playing field by using a weighted scale by which to measure proper projects. Um, it, again, it measure that scale is based upon a um, the concept of economic opportunity um, or opportunity cost um, for what could be potential in an area. What this number shows you here by comparing the opportunity cost slash investment to the average commercial cost is that the model says that this piece of pro this area should generate five times the amount of revenue as the average commercial property in the city. Um, and it's going to generate about three times that amount, the 21, not quite three, 21 to the eight um, million. So um, the one thing that I've mentioned here before that the model is not perfect and is being corrected upon currently, but the, the main challenge with it is that it's dependent on zip code level data. And um, in this particular case, we're in 63103 zip code and that zip code uh, is probably because, partly because of its size, but also because of its diversity of building types, um, it is the one where having just a simple weighted average is probably the, has, if you were to draw a trend line, it would probably be the one that would um, sort of have the least, uh, um, the lowest p-value, if you will, if you understand statistic terms, meaning that it uh, has the lowest explanatory value uh, for any other zip code. Uh, the model has the lowest explanatory value. Um, all that's saying is that there's there's an error function in here that we've got to uh, we've got to fix, and we are fixing, but it's it's requiring a pretty heavy load of uh, statistical analysis, doing cluster-based GIS analysis and and a multiple regression analysis. But um, but we're making progress on that. So, long story short is. You have to take that context into account when you look at the score, which gives it three out of five. So when I see a project generating 22 million versus the average commercial cost in the city of eight, even though it only gets three, I still think that that's a pretty good project. Um, remember, three and a half is usually what we're trying to get to. So even with that really high bar, it's it's not far off. Um, so with that said, the um, the total project cost uh, you can see is about 55.5 million almost. Um, uh, you can see the uh, the split between debt and equity. Um, uh, tax credits are playing a, and new market tax credits are a key factor in making this project work as well. The uh, the local portion of the incentive is about 9.3 percent of the project cost, um, and the uh, the total. Um, public incentive when you include the tax credits is about 36.6. Um, substitution effect rates used um, is pretty standard. Um, the retail sales we use 25%, the hotel 58, um, 
and uh, again, the payroll is is not including the uh, that three percent is not including what would move from other parts of the city. That's including basically jobs that would be lost in other parts of the city, basically due to competitive factors with the the new businesses that are coming in. Um, so with that said, I guess I'll open it up to any questions. Uh, was there anyone who signed in on this, Jonathan? Uh, Nobody signed in for anything. Okay. Uh, well, why don't we open it up to committee then? Um, Alderman Kennedy, do you have any questions on this project? No. Uh, Alderman Boyd, do you have any questions on this project? Not at this time. Um, Alderwoman Davis? Uh, I'd like to ask the developer to come up. I don't have any questions for Jonathan. So on your uh, new market tax credit, is this your uh, individual application or is the city providing the tax credits, the new market tax credit? So there's actually two components. The city has um, allocated a $7 million allocation to the St. Louis Development Corporation, and then the remaining balance of tax credits we need are getting from an alternate source. Okay. The, um, there was one other one when he was talking about. Oh, okay. So, um, I was trying to listen. You were talking a little fast. Sorry. On your federal, on your federal uh, tax credits, have they been approved? Yes. Okay. And you're just waiting on the state. Yes. Yeah, so the the building in the orange again, we're completely through the tax credit process. Uh -huh. The building, the Beaumont building. We have approvals. We're just waiting, and we're in line for the reservation. Okay. All right. Uh, we have so much confusion in Jefferson City. I'm just uh, worried about a lot of projects right now. Not an easy water to navigate. That's for not sure. Not easy right now. Okay. Uh, I think that's my my only questions because I was trying to follow that financing to see where everything was. And so I do have a question for the alder person. The only other thing maybe to note is that, um, just as a side note, that one of the reasons why this project is, is viable and we have all the investors and people on board is because of NGA. This will be one of the- Oh, I know. Jefferson's one of the major uh, thoroughfares to get yeah. up there and we're kind yeah. of counting on ha helping to boost what's around. People are running people. over each other trying to do projects that wear me out, I understand. So, <laughs> you know, it's just a kind of a, a you know, uh, not to the city, though, of all the great stuff that's happening. Mm -hmm. that now mm -hmm. something like this is viable because of yeah. other spur development. So, so that's exciting. Yeah. And so, uh, Alder Person, I wanted to ask you, um, I know that you are normally not in support of incentives. And um, actually, we have a large number of people who are not in support of incentives. Here at the board, you feel comfortable? Yes. Uh, yeah. And I... I I've not been someone who's not supportive of incentives. I've been supportive of the reform and uh, voted yes on the work that you did here on the resolution um, for the interim projects. You did what? The work that you did here in HUDs for the resolution <coughs> that we passed unanimously for um, interim reforms while we work on a, a permanent. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So I've been supportive of those. Okay, yeah, we, we need a lot of work done. Absolutely. I agree. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you feel comfortable with this. Um, it has uh, a lot of potential, it's very exciting, and uh, it's going to be successful. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Kotar. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, maybe I wasn't following. On the new market allocation, is you said it's from, part of it's from SLDC. Where is the other source of the new markets? We had, this is Jason again, we had a um, verbal reservation from McCormick Barron and, and Enterprise Bank, and as we both know, or all of us know, they didn't get the allocation. Yeah. So we're uh, working with Baker Tilly, Terry Preston right now, and she's got four different sources that, that are interested in the project, and so we're in the process of getting them information on kind of the status from where we presented in Miami last year and where we're at today um, that will go out this week in order to confirm that last allocation so we can move forward with the project. Okay. All, all phases of the project. And I may have missed this as well. I'm sorry, but the uh, 
45 apartments, are these all market rate apartments? They are, yes. So just to be clear, there's no affordable housing component to this project, right? Correct. Okay. I'm just asking because that would usually get asked of a project in the seventh ward. Um, all right. And what are our what are we looking at per square foot on rents? What are we projecting? For residential, we're projecting. On residential, yes. On residential, we're, we're projecting a dollar twenty-five uh, square foot per month. Sorry, say that again. A dollar twenty-five okay. per square foot per month. And the hotel. Do you have a flag for this? Uh, we are very close to getting the approval. It's kind of like the chicken and the egg. Do we get the abatement? Do we get the incentives? But um, for IHG, uh, even Grand Hotel, um, part of the premise behind the project is, is kind of going after the mindset of the younger generation and this healthy living, healthy working environment kind of thing. The even Brand Hotel uh, chain as part of IHG um, is specifically um, focused at being in an urban environment and supporting healthy um, stays, healthy environments. So. Great, thank you. No further questions. Alderman Ogilvy. Um, the developer, come back up. Sorry, thanks. Uh, it, so the hotel and the parking garage, and to some extent, this um, shipping container retail are not really designed yet. Is that accurate? Um, the, the hotel is designed. Um, the parking garage is designed. The, the uh, shipping container retail village is basically a prototype of the one in Tulsa. We're just going to be adjusting the configuration a little bit based off of our final land swap agreement with AT&T. Okay. It's sort of hard to evaluate this since there's different parcels and different projects without it is a very complicated project. Yeah. some of those designs, I guess. Um, I mean, I think typically we'd have if that stuff exists, we'd have it available um, at these committee hearings. Uh, and I'm, I think I'm correct in that the 90% tax abatement applies to all of these parcels, correct? Correct. Right. Um, is, can Mr. Ferry come up for a minute? Because you have all these different uses and incentives going to different parcels mm -hmm. um, and this mix of existing buildings and, and new buildings, uh, is this kind of a hard one to, to evaluate? I mean, I, I know you talked about that a little bit, um, but it seems like this is a particularly complex one because you have this wide variety of, of projects and I suppose to some extent, we don't know 100% if all of those projects will come to fruition, correct? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's true. Um, I think that, uh, okay, so I guess the, the way to think about the cost benefit is it looks at, uh, the good thing is, is that this entire property, all the parcels, even though it's a bunch of different ones and they're not all contiguous, they're all in the same, uh, neighborhood, the same zip code, the same land use. Um, so therefore, when it comes to uh, sort of picking, a, at least as far as the model goes, when it comes to picking a, a bar to compare it to, it's the same bar for all of them. So I didn't have to come up with some sort of blended thing. That would have been that would have been tricky. So um, so in terms of what we're comparing it to, it's it's the same across the board. And so in that case, it was just really summing up the size of every parcel, even though they're not contiguous just all the parcels that are involved, including uh, like ancillary parking parcels and that, those types of things. And that's a large reason because it's such a all together, there's so much land area involved. That's really um, a large part of the reason that's driving that total cost, uh, that sort of that average and that um, opportunity cost is such a high number. Um, what's the total acreage? Do you remember? I don't have it. I might have that on this page, I don't remember. No, I just got the building square footages, but um, but anyway, it's it's a lot of land being covered, and so again, it's uh, the the model is a per square foot of land utilized. So, um, so in that sense, it was really just so. I guess the denominator part of it really wasn't 
that complicated. It, the numerator part in terms of figuring out how much revenue was going to be generated, in all honesty, even though there were a lot of components to it, there are a lot of components to a lot of projects, like uh, City Foundry had, had office plus retail, didn't have mm -hmm. residential, but um, um, you know, we've got a lot of projects that have a lot of components, and so, um, so I wouldn't necessarily say it was that much more complicated than usual. Okay. Um, is, uh, so is the parking garage being built primarily to support the hotel? Sorry, thank you, John. Primarily to support the hotel, or does the hotel also have its own parking? No, it's actually, um, it's been a long, long conversation about how to make the parking garage work, because as we all know, parking garage don't ever pencil fiscally, so we're, we're trying to make it as small as possible and also taking in, into consideration technology with self-driving cars and all, all those things that we don't overbuild. Um, but it actually equally draws from the hotel, the Beaumont project, the Mindenhall project, the box yard, um, some overflow of replacement parking for AT&T and their existing facility. So it really is 100% flex, um, overlapping hours and parameters that go into that. We've worked with a parking consultant in St. Louis, St. Louis Parking, one in Tulsa to try to figure out how to make sure that we're sizing that thing right and um, not overbuilding because clearly, like I said, it doesn't, it just they just don't fiscally work. Um, so you, can you talk about how these, how all these different buildings are phased, what your plan is for you know, what goes first, what goes second? So as soon as we get the stamp, the, the Mindenhall building starts basically within 48 hours. We're basically geared up to to start that project, and that's the one in the orange. Mm -hmm. And then the phasing of the um, the Beaumont building, the large one, will be July August construction start date, based off of receiving our uh, getting the tax payment, but receiving our allocation from the state tax credit side, and getting our final HUD loan closing completely done. And then there's four. Can I stop you real quick. The, when that? you say state tax credit allocation, you mean historic tax credits, right? Yes. Okay. Con continue. Thanks. Yeah. So it's approved. We just don't have the reservation because of, of the cap, as you know. Um, and so the Beaumont building will start with three other little buildings around it that will support that. And then um, our anticipation with getting the new market allocation we need in order to finish that other kind of trifecta of the hotel, the parking garage, and the uh, box yard, those will all basically kind of run in tandem. And we're hoping to start that by the latest of, of next year, early next year. Okay. And they'll have just a little over, all together we'll have just a little over one year cycle and, and build. So what if that new market tax credit allocation doesn't happen. We're not going to talk about that. We are going to get that thing. Um, okay. Uh, okay, I guess that's all my questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> I have another question. All right. All the way to 19. Mm. Wow. Um, you just scared me. <laughs> Uh, you, you have a, um, your trajectory is, um, it could present a problem because I, I, I and it just kind of hit me that you might be here a little too early, uh, based on you, what you just said with all the start times and everything, uh, and, and all the ifs, uh, and then after hearing those questions, it also let me, it made it clear that you don't have a little over, almost 20% of your financing has not been secured. Does that bother you at this point? No, it's, it's actually the $7 million new market tax credit gap, is, it really is only 20% of that. So it's only about $1.4 million of the, of the overall bigger picture. And then you add the $5 million for state that has not been approved. And then you add it's the. It's approved. We just have to wait for the allocation to re, for it to be released. With them, that means it may not happen. Okay. Uh, and then um, you said something else. Are you waiting on uh, a portion of your new market tax credits too? The new market tax credits and the the release of the reservation of the historic are the only thing we're waiting on. Outside okay. of tax evasion. Yeah. So that that comes to about. Yeah, so it's about 17 percent of your finances. Okay. Um, I mean, you're the developer, and 
if you feel comfortable. It's not for buying. the faint, it's not for the faint of heart, but 56 okay. buildings later, we got we got to you know keep this boat moving. You know, okay. it's, lease up's going well and stuff, so we we need to we need to make the move. Okay. We tie these two neighborhoods together. It's very important, I think. Okay. And I have very strong financial partners. As you know that we've had pickups in the past with partners and getting that first 56 buildings done, but we have very, very strong financial partners, both from our St. Louis and from Tulsa in order to get this done. So we will clearly be able to weather any hiccups in the project, which makes us much more comfortable about taking the leap of faith on these last couple allocations that we need. Okay. But again, it's kind of the chicken, the egg, you know, they, people don't want to give us new market allocation if we don't know that our financial a structure makes sense and a big part of that financial structure is the tax abatement because you know okay. you know how it works okay that cleared that up I had a couple questions um, the and I know you covered this but I'm the the blue area is that is that going to be containers did you say yeah, that's uh, recycled shipping containers that are assembled in a way that create um, kind of like a new version of a strip center, only in an urban environment with cargo texture that also creates plazas in essence that kind of the whole idea of it is, is the, those plazas are programmed with fashion shows and little music things and all the kinds of things that are happening in order to bring all the people in the neighborhood together to create a sense of community. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's, it's, they've done it in London and Las Vegas, the, the most recent one in, in Tulsa, and it really does exactly that. And that's one of the most exciting things about this project is, again, you've got all these residential developments in downtown West and all the stuff that we've done in the Midtown neighborhood, but there's not really that box yard village that brings everybody together to hang out and chat and listen to music and grab food and shop a little and all those things. So it's a very, very important part of this project of as following up on alderman ogilvy do you have did you say you have renderings of, of your project but you didn't bring them today is that did i understand that right yeah we do have renderings uh, uh, modeled renderings of the, that project in the hotel sorry that's my fault i thought we it, would, it was just going to be in the packet yeah. well is there a way you can get that out to us i you know, i mean yeah i presume all that went through planning so somebody's reviewing the design of it on all of those or what what type of design review do we put through projects through I if well, we did, did anything in this trigger a, a review before planning or anything or uh, well the plan Commission has reviewed it yes okay. but not not yeah because they've already uh, uh, signed off on it okay but not in the individual design aspect I mean that that will be coming as individual projects come through oh, okay we have reviewed the uh, Mendenhall project and, and thoroughly approved that one and the Beaumont is uh, is thoroughly designed and, and we've approved that but of course those are both historic tax credits so they mm -hmm. they both uh, have a lot of good design we've seen preliminary uh, designs of both the uh, garage and the hotel and that looks fine and yeah the the, the boxcar thing could really be exciting. I mean, it's just a very, you know, you, you get a little sense of it at the high point uh, drive. Well, it's in. just that I, it's, you know, it's fine that some, you know, this stuff is all subjective, but it'd be nice if we saw it as well if yeah. be, before we vote on these things. Um, and, and they're going to start sequentially. Is there, wh what reason is it that we did not do this in a series of separate bills? You know, I, I know that we do scattered site stuff from time to time. Is there, was it, Dale, was there a specific reason why we didn't? Well, it just kind seems of to be all tied together, and uh, it made sense to us to do it all in, in one bill. Obviously, it could have been divided into various bills. Well, but it gave him more of an advantage as, as a developer. Yeah, the problem is that, that then the developer doesn't, I mean, all these little pieces fit together, and if he gets a piece approved and then it's come back for the next piece it just seems like uh they're they're not even they're no, kind of contingent just, upon each yeah. other well i'm just trying to figure out because i think he has kind of one group of investors that are going to invest in this as a project okay mm -hmm. but you're not going to start them all at the same time that's going to affect your tax abatement time 
So that's what I'm concerned about. Well, that's what I was, yeah. I guess that was what you I was getting at is, is if there's a. And so it should have been, it should have been a, a area wide with the starting times of different sections. Dale, uh, yeah, I guess that's what uh, the older woman from the 19th is kind of raising. Sequentially, if, if the project becomes delayed, you have 10 year tax credit, can you, are you starting the clock separately on each oh, yeah, parcel? Oh, yeah, parcel by parcel. Tax abatement is is uh, <clears throat> parcel by parcel. And in fact, before, uh, as each piece comes together, it's now going before the LCRA to be designated developer of, of each piece, and uh, a redevelopment agreement will be together for each piece. We did the redevelopment, the approval by LCRA has already happened on the Mendenhall, and we have a redevelopment uh, agreement oh, see, put together for that. Here. Now the, the next one is the Beaumont, which is pending, and we'll get a redevelopment agreement for that. And then the developer will bring each piece in, and, uh, so if it takes and we'll go before the LCRA board ahead. for each piece. So it takes four or five years to do this. You could. Oh, sure. You know, you yeah, you wouldn't start a tax abatement on the whole thing. You'd start yeah. it uh, on a piece by okay. piece basis. We will start tax abatement on the Mendenhall, for example, when it's finished, uh, you know, and, and then the tax abatement will begin, and the same will be true of, of each other component of the project. And Jonathan, if you uh, got a quick question for you, Jonathan, uh, the, the whole idea of the s hotels, you know, they had an article about the number of hotel rooms coming online and, you know, the fact that we're incentivizing hotels still. Um, and, and I have several in my ward, full disclosure, so I'm, uh, and they have received at least some incentive. Um, are, are we going to approach the, do you envision us getting to the point where we, we can go ahead and start uh, gearing these things based on demand? So for example, hotel rooms, I think it's in everybody's interest to, to get hotel room rates higher absolutely um, mm -hmm. and um, you know I I guess I understand the idea of the convention hotel when we kind of provide a very generous incentive on that because our, our the success of our convention center was so tied to the convention hotel but at some point I, I mean are, are we Going, getting to the point where we can actually begin an, analyzing supply and demand factors so that we can actually start telegraphing. I, I, when I was in the private lending industry many years ago, we used to go ahead and uh, the lenders that I used to work with would go ahead and, you know, they, they would have kind of targets for different products that they were interested in based on their, you know, internal mm -hmm. analysis of you know the national market so they may have an appetite for a while for hotels and then they might move them office buildings and then the retail or whatever depending on what they're trying to do to, to balance out their portfolio mm -hmm. have have we gotten to that level do you envision us getting to that level of sophistication or um pretty close to it i think um so um i, I guess maybe i could bring up uh, a hotel project that is coming up in alderman navarro's ward um, that's the, an AC branded hotel. Um, they'll probably be coming before you guys. Um, I'm not exactly sure when, but in the near future. But um, they're not getting any tax abatement. They're getting tax certainty or tax assurance. Um, essentially what that means is that um, once the hotel reaches uh, stabilization, so basically it's the second or third year, It'll pay normal taxes up until that point in time, and then it'll have like the full valuation at that year, year three, and then from there the growth will be capped at one percent a year. So, for example, the total value, and that'll go for until um, for seven additional years, so a total of ten years. But um, essentially, the total value of that tax cap um, is like two hundred and forty thousand dollars on a forty-five million dollar project. So, um, so yeah, we are, and that was based it, um, all on market analysis and market data um, conversations we had with uh, people that are in that uh, that field of expertise, um, uh, a company called HVS. Um, so, so yeah, I think that you know, in this.
project. Um, Let me just a second to clarify. That project's outside of downtown in an unoccupied parcel, so it's actually on the agenda of the Neighborhood Development Committee next week. So okay. it won't be before this committee. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so I think to answer your question, we are getting that direction. Um, you know, again, I think this project, um, uh, you know, part of the thing that drove that project to that conclusion was that um, it had a, uh, a very high rate of return. And I think that in this project where, and that was basically just a hotel, uh, in this project where you've got a lot of other components, um, you know, I've only got a single rate of return calculated. It's possible that the, the hotel is in, a, in essence generating a high enough, I mean, I, again, I haven't calculated the components separately. So it's possible that the hotel is maybe carrying the, the rest of them forward or it's possible that the rest I, of them I are carrying the hotel the forward. My, so if we, we identify certain product, you know, project types as, as mm -hmm. being more profitable or less profitable, Mr. Chair, I think uh, we talked about this. I'm sorry, this is a, I'm Otis Williams. We talked about the idea of doing, uh, you know, some kind of study about hotels and about other uh, and other projects as we go forward. But we also had a number of projects that were in the pipeline. Right. And so this is one of those that's been. No. In, I, yeah. Yeah. I understand and, that. I'm and, just trying to. I, and I'm we trying will. to figure out where we're going to be a year or two years from uh, now, we, where I we actually start in a, in a trying year or two to years, I think be, we'll be proactively pretty, yes, we will targeting be proactive. products, projects that are actually, you know, that we feel are profitable for the city as opposed to reacting to what developers are asking for. And, you know, as an example of that, if we're going ahead and, you know, I'm going to pick an example up, uh, we want to go after certain retailing. Well, cer certain retailing is kind of a zero-sum game for the city in that use gas stations as an example I mean we we don't want to incentivize the gas station we all we're gonna do is take gas you know sales away from something a block away but if we're going ahead and incentivizing retail that doesn't currently exist in the city where we have you know a very low substitution effect um, are if we're gonna go after hotel rooms are we gonna be going after hotel you know are we doing something that will detract from you know, hotel sales somewhere else in the city? Are we going after something that would be net new sales for the city? And I think different niches and different hotel products are going to end up having much different substitution effects. And I think we need to, you know, ideally, as we begin going forward, that we would start bundling our incentives and actually almost bundling them and sending out requests for proposals for somebody to build something that doesn't currently, you know, exist in the city or, or will not adversely affect existing city business am i making any sense at all I understand. okay all right well yeah so and that's I, where i would like us to go at some point so right yeah i guess um one thing i'd add on that um just what i've experienced in looking at the numbers on these things um so hotels even though they um you know again i've got a 58 percent substitution effect rate i think that's probably pretty conservative um what I found is that because hotels generate, when it comes to like amount of revenue they generate to the city per square foot of building space, they probably are the highest revenue producer to the city of any property type. Um, so in my experience, hotels are really good for the city as long as we're not giving any of the sales tax back. If we're sharing the sales tax back with the, with the hotel, then all of a sudden that substitution effect rate is really critical, right? But if we're keeping a, all the sales tax, even if there's a substitution effect rate on a, on a big portion of it, we're still keeping a lot. So, so that's one thing to say. I want to say. But the other thing I want to say is that in, in hotel market is is very um, uh, what is the word I want to say? Like stratified. There's a lot of different segments to the hotel market. Um, I know that sort of like on the upper end, similar to the the project that we looked at with the. Um, that's the AC hotel. Those comparable hotels have a, a current occupancy rate of 74.5%. And um, in the hotel industry, and actually the, the best, best performing of those have 90, 95% occupancy rates. Right, well, why don't we, well, let's take this all offline. I'm, sure. I think yeah, we're getting a little in the weeds here for some of the folks. So, um, 
All right, are there any other questions or comments on this, sir? Uh, hearing none, the chair will entertain a motion on board bill 220. I move that we pass board bill 220 with a due pass recommendation. Been moved. Is there a second? Second. Alderman from the 18th seconded. Um, did we lose someone? Yeah, we did. No, he's not in the room. We don't have a quorum. Uh, is there a oh, he's question? over there? No. Oh, I didn't see him. Okay. <laughs> we, could, we could do previous roll, could we not? Or, yes, we could. Okay. Is there a request for previous roll? Alderman from the 18th requested previous roll. No objections to the previous roll. We'll consider this board bill to pass out of committee with a due pass recommendation. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Could, I, um, could, could I make a request that we distribute whatever architectural renderings there are um, for these parcels to the to the committee I'll make sure that you get those mr. chairman okay appreciate that thank you <clears throat> okay next up Alderman from the uh, seventh uh, board bill number 255 thank you mr. chairman members of the committee um, board bill 255 which I'm hoping today to just have sort of a preliminary discussion um, I think it's uh, a topic that members of this committee might not have a lot of familiarity with uh, and it's Pretty important to downtown. Uh, this has to. This board bill has to do with uh, the downtown steam loop and the Solid Waste Management Development Corporation, um, which have been in place for a long time and uh, rarely get talked about. Um, so, just by way of reference, and, and we've got a number of people here to, to speak and answer questions. Um, the there there is a steam loop system downtown that provides heat to many downtown buildings, including all of the city's owned buildings, um, and. That is powered by a plant just north of downtown on the North Riverfront, the one with that formerly owned by Ameren with the big smokestacks that we often see. Um, and, and it's a cogen plant that brings in natural gas. And Mason Miller, the CEO of Ashley Energy, can tell you more about how that works. But basically, it, it, it powers turbines that provide steam throughout the city and also provide uh, power electricity back to the grid through, through the spinning of those turbines. Um, and we're in a position now where, you know, we've had a number of developments downtown that have, uh, that we've incentivized that have then left the steam loop. Um, and when people leave the steam loop, you know, that impacts the viability of the system and also the city's rate. Uh, you know, we're, we're on this loop. We, we get our heat from it. We don't have boilers in the basements of all of our buildings. Um, you know, if, if the system were to not be viable, um, as its biggest customer, the city would be in, in, a, in, a, in a tough spot. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is to start the conversation on, you know, when we're looking at incentives for downtown, for, for, for folks within the area where the steam loop operates or very close by, um, that we are encouraging developments that are getting assistance to utilize the loop. Um, so, and we've, we've done something similar already through PACE. Uh, there, was a, there was a brief time when PACE was new where they incentivized a couple projects that then left the loop. We incentivized them to you know, basically use other forms of uh, energy. PACE has stopped doing that. This board bill speaks to that, sort of codifies what is already the policy of uh, the Clean Energy Development Board. And I think we're looking to, down the road, do that for city municipal incentives as well. Now, as part of that, um, you know, the, the, the operator uh, has agreed um, to take basically 5% of net revenues um, and put them into a maintenance fund because we don't, I mean, Mr. Bradley, Rich Bradley can probably speak more to this, but I think we have a small maintenance fund right now because we own the pipe, we own the actual infrastructure of the loop and are responsible for its maintenance. Um, and, and that's obviously very costly, and so we need to be shoring that up. Uh, going forward, looking forward, you know, one of the things we learned through the Amazon bid was um, Amazon wanted uh, bidders, cities that were in, uh, producing bids, to have local energy districts, which the steam loop is. Um, that is something they were encouraging, and that is something that all the applicants that made it to the next round had. Um, we did not, but we do actually have one. Um, technology exists now to use these loops not only for heating but also cooling. Uh, ours isn't set up that way, but could be in the future. Um, so with that, I'd like to, if I could, turn it over to uh, Mason Miller from Ashley Energy, the owner of the uh, Cogen plant, to talk more about what they're doing, uh, and then we can hopefully answer some questions. Maybe Mr. Bradley and Otis can talk as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mason. 
Thank you, Mr. Kotar. Uh, Chairman Rohde, members of the committee, first of all, let me thank you for your time today. Uh, I am Mason Miller. I am the president of Ashley Energy, and as Jack mentioned, we run and own the uh, power plant uh, that sits just north, uh, near North Riverfront, just north of the Arch. Uh, it was built in 1904 as the original power plant in the city for the uh, St. Louis World's Fair uh, and provided all the power here. Uh, in 1972, uh, it transformed from being a coal-fired power plant to an oil-fired power plant. And then in 1999, it transformed again to being a clean uh, natural gas burning plant. Sitting here today, it is a highly modernized, uh, super efficient cogeneration plant. And so what does cogeneration mean? Uh, we call it cogeneration because we produce two types of energy from the same single unit of fuel, natural gas. We take natural gas in and create two products with that. One is electricity for the grid, and the second is steam, as Jack mentioned, that goes into the steam loop and heats buildings in downtown St. Louis. Uh, when you talk about energy efficiency, other than something like solar or wind, which is nature-driven, uh, cogeneration is the single most efficient option you have to create energy uh, for a modern energy infrastructure. It's much more efficient, multiple times more efficient than coal burning uh, electricity plants. Uh, it is multiple times more efficient than individual buildings, each having a boiler, each pumping natural gas in, trying to heat their own building uh, with that. Uh, as Jack mentioned, we've been here a long time, the plant has. Uh, it heats approximately 70 buildings currently in downtown. Uh, the power plant's connected to a network of 15 or 20 miles of pipes that sit underneath the city uh, that are owned by SWMDC. It's a nonprofit corporation that's managed by the city. Uh, so what we have is a system, which is our power plant and your steam loop together, uh, and that is what they call district energy. It's a district energy system. Uh, that steam goes into all sorts of buildings, hotels, stadiums, but it also heats, uh, importantly, 15 government buildings. There are 15 government buildings in St. Louis that depend on the steam loop as their sole source of heat. So the question is, why are we here? We're here because of the importance of that steam loop to the city of St. Louis. Without that steam loop, uh, the city buildings would not have any heat and the city would have no resolution for that problem but to buy millions and millions of dollars of boilers and figure out a place to retrofit and install them in this building and all the other city buildings. Without the steam loop, four or five dozen other buildings in downtown, large towers, small buildings, stadiums, all of our other users of the steam loop would need to find a solution. They would all have to spend millions and millions of dollars and buy boilers and put them in to place. Uh, not all of those buildings can do that. Some of the large hotels can afford to do that. Some of those buildings won't be able to do that, which means the city, in addition to buying its own builders, boilers, will also have to buy boilers or assist all of these other buildings in buying their boilers. Uh, and then the businesses that can't, they're gonna move. They'll be out in Clayton or they'll be in Chesterfield or they'll go out of business. We acquired this power plant about six months ago. Uh, and we did so because of a lot of good leadership decisions uh, that well predated us by folks here in the city. Folks like Rich Bradley, Mike Garvin, uh, Todd Wolterman, uh, Otis's group, folks in the prior mayor's office, folks in this mayor's office, uh, and a bunch of people I don't even probably know yet. Um, they all collectively realized that our predecessor was running the steam loop, for lack of a better term, into the ground. During the time our predecessor owned the steam loop, over the course of approximately 10 to 15 years, they let the user base fall off by 25%. Uh, this used to have 100 plus buildings on it. It fell to 20, 75 or 70 now. What did they do to resolve that? Go try to find more users, work with the city to try to develop the steam loop? No, what they did, increase rates on the people that were left. When the critical mass went down, they pushed up the price on the pieces that were there. No different than if you're in a condo building and 10 of the condos end up foreclosed and vacant. Who pays the CAM fees and the common area fees for the remainder? Who's ever left? We now know that our predecessor had roughly a five-year time horizon for the remainder of the steam loop. They were going to continue to let that pattern go, continue to push up city rates, push up other customer rates, 
more people would come off the system, they'll just keep increasing rates, pulling cash out of the thing. The inevitable result would be that it would fail, they'd close the plant, and they were done. They don't have any interest in staying, they didn't need it. Recognizing that, the folks that I just mentioned, uh, Mr. Bradley and others, forced our predecessor to sell the plant uh, and give the chance for the steam loop to be uh, revitalized. So why does that matter? It's uh, sort of like the Dickens novel, A Tale of Two Cities. Let me start with the first one and tell you about Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown, Ohio has a district energy system much like St. Louis. Uh, it was built at the turn of the century to support their downtown central business district. I've seen it, I've been there, I've talked to the people that are there. In the 1990s and 2000s, Youngstown had an operator much like our predecessor. That operator and no one in Youngstown required anyone to use the steam loop. They simply let the operator do as he wished, raise rates, if people fell off, he raised rates again. That worked, but it doesn't work forever. Approximately a year ago, Youngstown finally reached that point where they crossed critical mass and fell below it. And they lost it when the university there uh, purchased its own boiler system, its own plant, and they did so with Ohio tax incentive dollars. Uh, and the effect of which was the steam plant, the steam loop in Youngstown was finished. It financially collapsed. As a result, the entire central business district in Youngstown faced an immediate financial crisis. All of the city buildings, all of the other users, they all were faced with an impossible choice then. They had two choices. Do we go buy boilers for everyone and our buildings and spend millions and millions of dollars? Or now do we just put millions and millions of dollars into subsidizing what's left of the steam loop? Neither one's a viable alternative. Got worse though. The state stepped in at Youngstown. The Ohio Public Utility Commission appointed a receiver to take over the city's steam loop. Receiver came in from outside, paid his monthly retainer fee to manage the thing. What did he do? He hiked rates even further. They passed an emergency tariff, increasing rates on every remaining user. Businesses left downtown Youngstown. They moved over to a neighboring town uh, called Lordstown, where they're putting in a new cogeneration plant. Uh, businesses bought boilers, the ones that could afford it. What did Youngstown do? Well, they couldn't afford boilers, and now they're trying to monitor all these people putting in boilers, trying to monitor the safety of those boilers and inspect them. And then just last month, it got worse. The city has now decided to explore options to sell their few remaining assets that have some value to pay their steam bills and buy boilers to pay for their heat. They're talking about selling their water utility to raise enough capital to pay their utility bill. But like I said, this is a tale of two cities. Let me tell you about the other one, Minneapolis. Just like St. Louis, just like Youngstown, Minnesota has a district energy system. Minneapolis does. It was also built at the turn of the century for the exact same reason, to heat the central business district. I've seen it, I've talked to the people there, I've visited it. Just like St. Louis now, and just like Youngstown before it, Minneapolis reached a point in the early 2000s when they had to decide what to do. Their downtown core had to make some tough decisions about their infrastructure. Businesses were leaving, they were heading out to the suburbs, they were heading out to the Mall of America where they have the, the roller coaster. Uh, and the city of Minneapolis realized that their steam loop was now supporting uh, maybe 40% of the business users were city buildings and government buildings, and they were losing their core user base. So what did Minneapolis do? They made the decision at that point to embrace district energy and the steam loop. Now, they were way ahead of the curve on this stuff. This was back before green energy and energy efficiency was, was a big deal or was a catchphrase. Uh, nowadays, cities, cities like St. Louis, are realizing that energy efficiency is important, that cities have to be on the front edge of that, that process, that no matter what we do, we are going to, as a, a country and as a world, use more energy. I have a phone in my pocket that now talks to my iPad, that talks to my computer, that burns more energy than it did two years ago, and my car talks to all of that. We use energy, and we have to be efficient in the way we use it. Minneapolis got that. They understood their steam loop was the most efficient option they had to provide an energy infrastructure. And that makes sense. It is always going to be more efficient, if operated correctly, to have a central, high-performance turbine <coughs> engine creating steam and pushing it out to all the users than having every user with their own individual boiler trying to heat their individual building, bringing natural gas in one by one. 
They understood that district energy steam reduces the carbon footprint by 50% versus electrical use uh, and traditional electrical utility plants, that you eliminate infrastructure costs, uh, they're more efficient, um, that unlike electricity service, which is subject to outages, and frankly, here we know that there are quite a few electricity outages when the storms come rolling through, district energy is 99.9% .9 uh, reliable. I can tell you from my knowledge in the past two decades at the Ashley plant, the building may be old, the equipment is not. It has had one outage. And that outage was a result of a barge fire, I believe, that occurred out in the water that wasn't even the fault or uh, related to the Ashley plant. It is a redundant system. That plant up there, if the entire electrical grid goes down in the Midwest, we'll still be making heat. We have a pipeline that connects directly to the inner uh, state pipeline system, and we'll keep pushing out heat regardless what happens to electricity. Minneapolis realized that district energy was better because it didn't require on-site fuel storage. Buildings didn't have to have backup boilers and redundant boilers. And you, they also didn't have to pay insurance to insure those boilers, and they didn't have to worry about boiler accidents like we had down in Soulard, if each building has a boiler. Uh, I'm proud to say that this plant up at Ashley, and, and Dan Dennis, who's here, who has been with the plant, and actually he's the one who designed the cogeneration system in 1997, uh, we have gone over 20 years without an on-site workplace injury. Uh, and, and when I say on-site injury, I don't mean just uh, someone getting killed. Over 8,000 consecutive days, and we haven't had a person twist their arm and leave work or fall down a stair or anything else. It's a safe plant and it's redundant and reliable. So what did Minneapolis do? They use legislation to require customers to utilize their steam loop that the city depended on. Instead of using tax incentives, provide capital base for developers to be able to subsidize the cost of a boiler, they conditioned the receipt of tax incentives from the city on signing up and using the steam loop for their heat, for their project. In exchange for tax incentives, as part of that partnership with the operator of the plant in Minneapolis, the city actually start to get cash, not just concepts of benefits and job creation, but literally got checks back, rebates from the operator of the system. Uh, they even went so far in Minneapolis to require people to bring their trash down to the plant, businesses and individuals, to be turned into fuel for use in the system. As a result of that choice that Minneapolis made 15 years ago, they've revitalized their downtown into one of the most vibrant, energy efficient, technologically advanced downtowns there is in the country. Since the year 2000, their urban population in the core district served by the steam loop has increased by 30 uh, percent. But it's more than just residential growth. Target headquarters. They're in downtown on the steam loop. And do you know where they're located? Literally across the street from the power plant. Power plant provides all the heat and pulls all the heat off those servers too. They cool the buildings there too. You also have United Health, 3M, XL Energy, uh, Best Buy, uh, US Bank, General Mills. They're all locating and have their headquarters on the steam loop. Minneapolis isn't alone. Jack mentioned Amazon. Uh, I don't know how many of you have followed what has happened with the Amazon bid process since they narrowed to 20 cities. Uh, I read an article last night, though, that uh, if you take a look at those cities, the one thing they all have in common, uh, even the small cities like Austin, like Columbus, uh, Ohio, like Raleigh, North Carolina, of those 20 cities, they all have one important thing in common. They all have a robust district energy system that that city supports and promotes. Uh, and when you look at all of the cities nationwide that are developing their downtown cores in energy efficient manner, uh, Nashville, Denver, Portland, Oregon, uh, Austin, Texas, Seattle, Oklahoma City, every one of those cities has an advanced district energy system and steam loop, and the cities are pushing the use of those. The bottom line is you can have and you need to have uh, buildings, stadiums, hotels, apartments, condos, uh, grocery stores. All of the things that all of the developers in St. Louis are building above the ground is necessary. The stuff that Otis's group does to get those people to come do things in downtown St. Louis is absolutely necessary. And his ability to get those pieces all together is difficult. But in addition to having all of that above the ground, you have to have a stable, reliable, scalable, efficient system underneath them to support them all. And you can't do that if, if you don't have an energy infrastructure. So 
the reason we're here is because we think although the city has to encourage development and does a great job doing it, the city should be receiving a commitment in return. And it should be receiving a commitment from the folks that are receiving value from the city to use the city's steam loop to make sure it's there for the city, to make sure it's there to create that energy infrastructure, uh, to make sure that the buildings that the city relies on have an energy infrastructure that they can depend on. Uh, we don't want downtown St. Louis to face the same choice that Youngstown has faced or not have an opportunity to make a decision. We don't want St. Louis's skyline to be dotted with a bunch of buildings with boiler plants on top pumping smoke right out of the top of them. Uh, St. Louis is at that critical juncture. Due to the work of folks like Rich Bradley, who's here and can talk to you all, there's been enough foresight to recognize the issue. We'd like to see action taken to prevent it from becoming Youngstown and to help it become Nashville, help it become Minneapolis, help it become these other cities that have a core downtown built around district energy. Thank you. Um, before we go on on this topic, it's just uh, come to my attention that uh, today's meeting, while advertised in our calendar letter, was not advertised on the website. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our clerk council to right. kind of go through the legal ramifications for, of there, this. There was a question that whether or not the board had met with its obligation to publish notice within 24 hours. Board Rule 25 only requires that notice be published on the calendar or on the uh, bulletin board. The Board of Aldermen's bulletin board, it does not require electronic publication on the website. Okay, and so there was an, an, sure. an, an error by staff that, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. that did not happen. We are looking to see what happened. Okay, so um, the, the point is, is is that I'm not sure what we would have done if we passed stuff out and we had violated that rule but as it stands right now we are in compliance although it's uh, my understanding there's either legislation pending or else a rule change request that will I believe all the woman's uh, woman Spencer have it, the, does your bill uh, the public notice bill I don't recall did it have a requirement that meeting did it, there was also publication electronically yes but I don't believe that goes to second right okay so um, while perhaps we're not living in the spirit of the law, we are at least uh, living in the letter of the law right now. So all of our actions are okay at the, as we speak. As, um, so I, I want to just share that with the committee so everybody understands, you know, what's going on. Um, Alderman, did you have someone else? Did you have a, a additional? Mr. Chair, yeah, I know Rich Bradley's here as well, who could probably speak more to the SWMDC very briefly and, you know, some of the maintenance of the loop. And then I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity to just, you know, ask any basic questions they have about SWMDC or the loop uh, in our and, remaining and your few hope minutes. is not, your intent is not to pass anything Not else. today, no. I, I want to just get the conversation started. I mean, there may be some amendments, but... Um, you know, this is something that I think is important. You know, the viability of the loop's a big deal for downtown and for the city. And if we can come up with a way to actually, you know, get some money back from the loop to help with maintenance and its future, that's, I think that's critical. So, uh, Rich Bradley, I think, has got a couple of words to say. Thank you, Alderman, Chairman. Just um, make a comment that as president of the Board of Public Service, I'm also, by virtue of that, president of Solid Waste Management and Development Corporation. And so the previous owner of the plant was Trigen Violia, who I believe you heard just a little bit about. And I'd just like to give you just a little background on how they did business versus how the new owners of the plant do business. And so um, appointed to my position in 2009, uh, I was left with this task of negotiating a contract to extend uh, an agreement that had been with uh, Trigen Violia for 20 some odd years. And so with a lot of diligence, we worked very hard to try to come to very similar terms. And what we found was that uh, Trigen Violia used bully tactics to come in and dictate to us that either we went with the terms of their contract or they would shut the plant off which in virtue to us means that 80 some odd businesses in downtown st louis that utilize steam as well as all the city buildings could have been uh, virtually cut off from steam at any time uh, because these individuals did not want to 
work through a contract in good faith with us. We finally negotiated a contract which we were pushed into a corner on. Uh, the contract was not good for SWMDC. It was not good for the city. And so therefore we took uh, the means to look into uh, a buyout clause and exercise that whereby after about two to three years, uh, Ashley Energy wound up becoming the, the owner of the plant. Uh, also, just a couple of comments so that um, many things happen with Trigen Veolia as far as uh, lack of maintenance of the system, uh, things that they were responsible for, things that created safety issues. Uh, I think you've all watched the news lately and you've seen some issues uh, talked about with the steam loop. Many of those things were, many if not all of those things were their responsibility by contract and they just neglected to do them. And so I would say that our new operators have come on board. They are very diligent in their approach of uh, maintenance of the system. They are very diligent in their approach of communication with SWMDC. And they are also very diligent in their approach of trying to figure out how to get the best system in place how to keep all our businesses served on a continual basis as well as the city and how to figure out a plan to ultimately reduce rates by adding folks to the steam loop. And so part of this agreement or this ordinance or this board bill that we're talking about is, is to enable them, enable us to add people to the steam loop. Uh, in the past, we have looked at opportunities to have people consider it as opposed to requiring them to go onto the steam loop and what we found is that um, many of them would like to take the path of least resistance and just go with traditional means and methods so um, in behalf of Ashley I am very pleased that they are our can I ask operator. for some order from people in the room since we're still conducting a committee hearing uh, gentlemen if you could take your conversation out to the uh, Ante room, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. I'm very pleased that they're our operator currently. Uh, they have acted in very good faith for all of us, and they're doing everything in their power to not only bring the steam loop up to its proper maintenance, but to ensure that you know we have a good, long-lasting system in place. So um, I'd be glad to try to answer any questions that you have about that, but. Uh, as the president of SWMDC, I'm very pleased with, with what they've done so far. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Alderman Kodor, is there any other, uh, you have any other prepared no, speakers? Respectful. Obviously, we have a, a public safety meeting coming up, so if we could just for a couple minutes, if anyone has questions for Mason or Rich, and then we'll, uh, we will be back in the next session. Okay. Um, I'll run through this real quick. Alderman. Kennedy, do you have any questions? No questions. Uh, Alderman Boyd? Yes, I just have a, a quick question of the gentleman that made the presentation. Yep, Mason Miller. Yes, Mr. Miller. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I thought it was very enlightening, um, very educational. What was exciting to me was your comment about Minneapolis is getting rebate checks back or cash back. How did that happen? Uh, they had a system similar to the one we've that is proposed by Jack in the bill, which was essentially as new customers are added, uh, the steam loop operator there pledged to, re to pay a percentage of whatever that new user paid into the loop to literally pay it back to the city. Mm -hmm. And so what we have proposed in the legislation is that we'll pay a percentage of uh, what we receive from the user uh, for a period equal to as long as their incentive period. So if they come on the loop and they have 10 years of incentives and they, they stay on for 10 years thereafter, we'll be paying a proportion of that back to the city for 20 years. Okay, thank you. And Appreciate it would go it. straight back into the city, just checks or a reduction in their bill, however they want to take it. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alderwoman Davis. No questions. Um, Alderman Ogilvie. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miller. So you said there's about 70 remaining buildings on the, on the steam loop? That's correct. Um, and at, at the most there ever were, were 100 or more, do you know? I believe it was 105. Dan Dennis, you may know if that number's larger. 
Well, Tom said that there was a glitch, so there. So you're on camera. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm Dan Dennis. I have actually run that place. This is my third time. Uh, uh, I, I did run it for a short brief time for the other operator that left. Uh, we didn't see eye to eye on how to do business, so we parted ways. Uh, these guys came, picked me up, back in it. Uh, when I came in in 1997, we had 130 buildings actually on the system. And we kept that pretty stable from that time to about 2005. Uh, the, the business was sold at that time to, uh, it was actually a subsidiary of the Harvard Endowment Fund. I left during that time period uh, from 2005 to 2010. When I came back, there were about 95 customers left, so pretty big decline there over a five-year period. And now from after I left and uh, since Veolia took it over in 2007, it, it's down to about 70 right now. So we are actively working, trying to get some of the buildings back on the system, but it, there has been a big decline. Uh, a lot of that was a uh, lack of staying in communication with both the customers and potential new developments. We're trying to turn that around. We've been in contact with several of them, been talking with Amos and some of the other developers downtown, working with Canon Design Group. Um, we're revisiting some of the buildings that got off and, and trying to put a package together that meets their needs. Um, so as buildings are being renovated downtown, they were, they were building their own heating systems, is that what? Yes, and I mean, one of our big challenges is actually serving uh, the larger buildings that redevelop as, as lofts. Uh, most developers want to have all the utilities self-contained to each one of the units. Uh, Steam does not lend itself well to that uh, because all the piping that's required. The metering equipment is much more expensive than other. So the loft buildings have been a big challenge, but some of the bigger buildings have also gone off the loop. Um, and one of the reasons that it happens is they receive discounted money, tax abatement, tax incentives and such, and we're not receiving those. And our cost structure, we, we have no tax abatement whatsoever down there. So. It's kind of like if you give a person a boiler for free, yeah, then they'll put it in. So uh, we, would, we would at least like equal compensation, but we'd prefer just having a level playing field where if someone's getting incentives, uh, keep at least tell them to stay on the loop. That's what we're asking for. Thanks. Can I ask a question to Mr. Miller? Sure. So can you tell me a little bit about your company then and the ownership now? Sure. So my personal background, uh, with no offense to Jack, I am a recovering lawyer. Um, I uh, have been in the energy-related businesses for approximately 20 years, uh, beginning with coal-related work in uh, western Kentucky. I'm from Kentucky originally. Um, developed a large half-billion-dollar uh, mining operation in West Kentucky with uh, what was Peabody's assets there, backed by private equity funds. We uh, ultimately sold that. Uh, seeing sort of the writing on the wall for the future of climate change and coal properties uh, and have partnered now with uh, West Dame Corporation, a large Canadian uh, investment fund owned by an insurance company. It has, a, we have about a billion dollars under management. Uh, and uh, in addition to this system, uh, I can tell you th this is not the only city that um, is looking to revitalize district energy. So we have been in cities in Miami, north of Miami. We've been in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, surprisingly, and uh, maybe not surprisingly, the University of Missouri had the number one great district energy system uh, in the country in 2016. Um, so this is so all, we are owned uh, in part by me. I, I am a significant equity holder and in part by a large uh, investment fund. And this company that you're part owner of owns more than one uh, distributed energy boiler system. All right? sorts of energy okay. assets, pipelines, okay. Okay. Um, you know, uh, across the field of infrastructure. Got it. So here, what, what's kind of the minimum sustainable threshold you guys need for buildings on the system to, to maintain the system and keep it functional for those, for those buildings? And now I'll go back to sounding like a lawyer. It depends. Um, Ideally, we will have triple-digit users, large users, industrial users on the loop to provide the stability for when one does fall off from 
for bankruptcy for any other reason. Uh, maybe they move to Clayton, maybe they leave downtown. Uh, so we have the stability to absorb two things. One is a loss in potential users, and two is the ability to absorb variance in weather. Um, because we are, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, we are essentially modern day energy farmers. And so when you have a warm winter, I still have a power plant that has half a million dollars or more of just capital expenditure maintenance we spend every year maintaining turbines. We have uh, our staff and everything else. And when you have a warm winter, not like this year, but the year before, revenues drop off, which is fine. Everyone's steam bills lower, but we need to have enough users that it, it floats through that weather banded um, issue. Okay. Um, how, how easy is it to connect a new building and an existing building to the system? For the ones that we are already close to, because we, we have, like I said, 15 to 20 miles of pipe, very simple. Um, under this legislation, we would not expect building owners to be paying any connection fee. Uh, we would bring the pipe to them. Uh, a good example is the Wainwright building uh, we've been discussing with. It's a, of course, federal building, uh, a state building, state building. We have a, uh, a pipe literally into it right now. Uh, they aren't a user right now, but it goes under the, the dugout um, basement that they have under the street there. Railway Exchange is another example of a building that's on, physically in the proximity of the loop, just needs to be turned back on once it gets developed, things like that. Okay. Okay, I think that's all my questions for now. Thanks. Um, we have, uh, were there, uh, we had a posting problem for those who just came in. We have evidently a public safety meeting that's scheduled to come here. This bill is not going to be passed out today, but I, I, I believe, are, are several of you, are you here today to ask questions about this bill? I, I was going to ask a question, but I can wait. No, no, no. Well, we can, I, I, is there anybody out in the audience that was specifically here to hear about this bill? I want to try to be respectful of the people who came down here specifically. No. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and we'll provide two of you an opportunity to ask a couple of questions if that's okay. And then we'll try to make way for the 11 o'clock public safety. We have the director of public. Is it a public safety committee meeting? Oh, so, okay. We need to make at 11 o'clock for you. Okay. So let's try to keep this relatively brief. Uh, Go ahead. I'll, just, I'll, I'll make my question quick. Thank why don't we go ahead and do this by seniority if we could. So Alderwoman. Uh, and I will try to make this quick too. So the steam, steam is a public utility in a sense, am I right? No, it is not a uh, regulated public utility. But it is offered to the general public for use or is it, is, do you have to have some special connection to get on the steam no, loop? No, no, we would be available to any building uh, that wanted to use steam. But, it, that's in our footprint, sure. obviously. But, but I guess my second question was, is it, how is the pricing regulated? Uh, the city is in charge and approves all the pricing, SWMDC. Uh, is required. I cannot enter into any contracts unless SWMDC, and Mr. Bradley's organization, says that the contract's okay, and I cannot either set a price or change a price without his approval or the SWMDC approval. So the city regulates the pricing of steam, if I'm understanding you correctly, or the SWDC, which is controlled by the city Correct. of St. Louis, controls the pricing of the steam utility in downtown St. Louis. Um, So, Mr. Bradley, you mentioned some bullying tactics from the previous owner, uh, the previous owner of the boiler and all that system. Veolia was participating in some what you called bullying tactics with regards to contracts, et cetera. Yes. Uh, what steps have we taken to prevent a similar situation? I mean, you seem like a very nice guy. Uh, you're, you, don't, you don't have boxing gloves on, that sort of thing. But um, if, we've, if we've had a situation like that in the past, what prevents that from happening in the future? So originally, there was a long-term contract with um, Trigen Veolia. And what happened was, because the contract came to an end, we negotiated a five, we were pushed into f negotiating a five-year deal with them. The deal that we negotiated with Ashley Energy is a 20-year agreement, and it has clauses in there to prevent exactly what we're talking about. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, has the price of steam been set for the next 20 years? Has it been? Set 
for the next 20 years? Or is this something that could change over so time? What happens are is there's a set rate that is in the original contract and then the operator would have to come back to SWMDC to the board and they would have to request a rate increase, which actually happened only during the contractual changes with the previous operator. And is the price of steam different from by different by user? So one of the issues that came up in the KMOV story was that the city of St. Louis is paying more for steam than some of the private entities that are on the loop. Um, and so is that are those prices set by the board by entity? So it's all part of the agreement. And so if you would envision this at small, medium, large users, and there's a formulation of a fuel component, a capacity component, it's, a, it's an engineering formula that determines how much the actual steam rate is. But it is, it is in the contract, and it is calculated uh, by the company that provides the steam. And each individual contract, as Mason mentioned, is approved by SWMDC before it is, it is enacted. Generally speaking, in public utilities that have some level of public oversight, I realize this is not one of those, this is a privately held utility, um, but there's some level of public hearing process when determining rates and that sort of thing. Does any of that occur here with regards to the pricing set by the SWDC? So, as I mentioned, because it, it's actually a city-owned loop, a SWMDC-owned loop, and it's a partnership, mm -hmm. SWMDC is the regulator, and so every uh, board meeting that we have, every opportunity we have to meet and talk about these things is all public, open to the public and posted. And so the public is certainly welcome to come and put their input in on anything that we do. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, my last question is if, you know, so if we are um, sort of tying the incentives that the city is offering to development in the downtown area to using STEAM, um, the cost negotiation, I mean, what would be concerning, I would think, for the downtown development community would be that the cost associated with uh, heating and cooling their buildings could fluctuate um, over time um, and isn't necessarily determined. Well, they're locked into a, they're locked into a contract, which is a, a period of time that is negotiated and approved, and so that contract would not fluctuate during that time, uh, without input from the owner, from the steam company, and SWMDC. And and actually, you know, Mason, you may want to speak to that. Right. So, uh, take a situation where development A, uh, if this legislation were passed, receives an incentive and therefore agrees. Uh, to go on to the steam loop. In advance of them, either A, receiving the incentive, or B, going on the steam loop, they will know what the proposed contract with the steam, co with SWMDC says. It'll say, you know, the rate is X dollars or Y dollars. And so they can evaluate, well, that's way too much. The incentives aren't worth enough to make that economically make sense. But if the incentives mm -hmm. are more valuable than what they think the contract issue is, then they're going to take the incentive. So they will have a full plate of knowledge to make an economically wise decision. And the, uh, the other point I think Rich was making is that and when they sign that contract, that rate is locked. It won't fluctuate for the term of the contract. Now, after 15 years, if, if their contract expires and they say, listen, we may want to go on steam, we may want to use boilers now, then we can talk about a new rate or a different rate. But they'll be fixed and they'll know their cost. In I understand. Okay. That's good. That's good to hear. And just lastly, with the, uh, Ashley's a for-profit corporation, am I correct That's in that? Correct. So um, again, when determining those rates, I presume that the books would be somewhat open and, you know, be, if we're tying development again and we're offering incentives based on participating in your business model, that, that there is some level of public scrutiny involved in making sure that we're just not just yeah, sort of absolutely. driving SW additional profits. SWMDC to has a right in the contract with Ashley to come inspect our books, records, our plant, and everything else we have any time they want, uh, down to whatever detail they want. We, we are in the business and have focused our business model about focusing on public-private partnerships. And that only works if, if we are truly partners uh, and not adversaries. And so the contract we signed with them gives them all sorts of rights that might not exist in a normal two, two private companies negotiating but I'm happy to have the city as a partner in this to, to help build the steam loop to keep it there 100 years. Yep. 
good. Well, I'm glad we no longer have an adversarial relationship with our steam producer, and it sounds like um, you certainly do tell tales of cities very well. I appreciated hearing them. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be quick with my question. So far, we've been discussing um, steam versus boilers. For, um, and one of the things we're working on and we're exploring as a city is how to be moving towards more clean, renewable energy. And so my concern would be if we have a building owner who would want to move towards solar, for example, that they would then be locked out of these incentives potentially because they're not tying into the steam loop. So is there a way that building owners who are moving to something that would be more energy efficient um, would, would still have an opportunity to receive incentives through the city? Sure, there is. Uh, I mean, there's multiple ways to integrate solar within a, a steam system. You could have the solar uh, being used to offset peak usage. I, I mean, it's possible a building could completely heat itself with, I suppose, solar energy. But, I mean, I've been here a number of years in the Midwest, and there's a lot of days I don't see a lot of sun, and it feels really cold. Um, you could integrate those systems, the heat exchangers, all of it, to make a unified uh, system. I'll tell you that in, um, in Seattle and in Northern Virginia, They've done it, and they've done it in larger scale industrial settings. So you have data centers, which produce a massive amount of heat, uh, and the steam loop company taking the excess waste heat, and they're using that to preheat the water. And then the water is put into the boiler, already raised in temperature some, so they use less natural gas. And in the meantime, the solar panels, uh, which also have to be cleaned and use a significant amount of water, can take some of the water from the steam loop to use that, or the steam itself can be condensed and used to clean the solar panels. So there's it's all about efficiencies and thermal dynamics, and it, it really is a, a advanced way uh, of energy management. It's no longer just burn some coal and create some electricity. Great. Thank you very much. All right. I think that concludes the questions uh, by all the other people that had any. Um, and I, um, I would just suggest that uh, price theory is kind of an interesting thing, um, and I would do we have somebody on the city staff or do we have on retainer uh, a consultant or something that somebody who really understands price theory because you need to break this stuff down into fixed cost variable cost and you know if you're awarding somebody a monopoly there's there's a the, depending on what your pricing strategy is and you can have you know very different results so um do, have we contacted somebody or do you have somebody on staff or, or a retainer or a as far as far as the rates go right so we have you know the board of directors as well as the city counselor's office advises us on on all of our contracts yeah, what I'm telling you you ought to go out and get a professional economist and pay him a few thousand dollars from from one of the faculties if nothing else they uh, ended up using uh, well SWMDC in the city had retained uh, Burns McDonald which is International Engineering firm, right right. and they, they they happen to be based in Kansas City, luckily, but they are probably the leading district energy engineering firm in the world, outside of a couple in uh, the Arab Emirates countries, and they did a review of this pricing structure. It was about an 80-page modeled out tab document uh, okay. to create the different structures for the different pieces, and signed off and made sure that it was okay. there. And, you know, okay. They were working for them. Okay. And, and we hired them, and I, I didn't understand the question, and we hired them as part of this negotiation to buy the plant and um, had them do the full analysis of, I, I, of everything. I don't, I don't, all I'm saying is, is have somebody at the next, I, there's a lot to this when you're awarding somebody a monopoly, right. you know, there's a whole lot That's to, right. to monopolistic pricing that, you know, there's a lot more to it than just saying, oh, well, this sounds like a fair deal for us. and Let's get 60% right. or whatever the surplus. So that's all I'm asking is, is to make sure that we have somebody taking a look at it. And then it might help to have them come by here and at, at when we actually dig into this. This is the uh, last of the uh, uh, bills before us. We're not passing this out today. So we'll bring this up, I presume, next session. Uh, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, so what I'll do also is for members of the committee and folks that are interested, get everyone the existing agreement between SWMDC and um, and Ashley Energy, just so you can see it. And I think over recess, I'd like to, for anyone who's interested, you know, just head up there. It's just north of downtown to tour the plant, take a look at it so you can, you know, kick the tires, see what this place is. And uh, we'll, we'll renew this discussion next session. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Kennedy, uh, Chairman Kennedy. Motion to, uh, to, uh, to adjourn. 
I move that the HUS committee adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No objections. Thank you, and uh, we apologize for running a little over today.